Good evening. Uh, I'm Gavin Cleesby, the Director of Programs, Exhibitions, and Community Partnerships for the Massachusetts Historical Society, and I'm happy to welcome, to our, welcome you to our program. Uh, before we get started, uh, I wanted to offer a special welcome to anyone who may be joining us for the first time. If you are unfamiliar with MHS, we are an independent nonprofit organization that maintains a research library and hosts a wide variety of programs uh, on topics related to Massachusetts and American history. Uh, we are only able to produce these programs because of the support of our members. We hope you'll return for future events and we hope you'll support our work becoming a member or making a donation. Uh, this evening, we'll hear from Nancy Rubin Stewart on her new book, Poor Richard's Women. Uh, this work explores the life of Benjamin Franklin and his romantic attachments. Uh, she gives voice to the long neglected women Franklin loved and lost, the most prominent among them being Deborah Reed Franklin, his common law wife and partner for, 40 year, for 44 years. She was an independent, politically savvy woman and devoted wife who raised their children, managed his finances, and fought off angry mobs at gunpoint while he was across the ocean in England. Uh, Ms. Nancy Rubin Stewart is an award winning uh, author and journalist who specializes in women, biography, and social history. Uh, while raising children, uh, Nancy wrote for the New York Times under the byline uh, Nancy Rubin. Uh, that work and her experiences as a wife and mother prompted her first book, The New Suburban Woman Beyond uh, Myth and Motherhood. Since then, she's gone on to publish a number of different books, uh, including histories, which include but are not limited to uh, American Empress, The Life and Times of Marjorie Merriweather Post, The Muse of the Revolution, The Secret Pen of Mary Otis Warren and the Founding of a Nation, uh, and Defiant Brides, The Untold Story of Two Revolutionary Era Women and, their, and the Radical Men They Married. So uh, without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming, welcoming Nancy, uh, who will guide us through uh, our program this evening. It's a pleasure to be here uh, and, uh, and, and be back at the Mass Historical Society, even, uh, even if uh, remotely. Um, it's one of my favorite places in, in the world. Um, and I'm so glad, even though it's February and we had our storm, that the electricity is working. So Benjamin Franklin's shade must be doing something right. Um, but honestly, he, my research, I found that he was, um, his attraction to women, and he, and he loved women, he found it as dangerous and thrilling as electricity itself. And uh, so I, I'm going to do a PowerPoint presentation now, so we can talk about how, how that attraction um, both um, thrilled and repulsed him um, throughout his life. So now I'll share the screen. Thank you. This is uh, the cover of the book, as you've already seen it before. It's coming out in March. <clears throat> so we know about Benjamin Franklin. He was a fantastic scientist, statesman. Uh, of course, the famous uh, kite uh, uh, and uh, the key, the experiment, and of course, uh, signing and being present at all of the major events for the American Revolution. And it's one of our, he's our oldest founding father. He was born in 1605. Now, we think about Benjamin Franklin as um, being um, pragmatic. He's sort of, as one reviewer said, he's the ultimate arch rationalist. Um, so he's, he's famous for his discretion and these sayings that come from uh, poor Richard's almanac, his, his famous almanac, um, reflect that. Um, the honey's sweet, the bee has a sting. Beauty and folly are old companions. Keep your eyes wide open before marriage, half shut afterwards and dally not with other folks, women or money. Um, so that's who we think of him when we think of Ben Franklin. But of course, as Franklin scholars know, there's a lot more to him than, than that. And as I've learned, there's a lot more to him in terms of his, his private life. Um, the, this is just a copy of the second almanac. I don't know. Um, uh, and again, some of, these, some of these statements you've heard a thousand times, stitch in time, eat to live, don't live to eat, early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy and wise. And he did, he did these almanacs uh, right up through uh, 1757. Uh, and then some of them were combined or condensed into the, a book on, on, on money, a way to wealth. And we know Ben, of course, is one of our, uh, again, because of his um, what wisdom, his discretion. Um, he's, he's, of course, on this $100 bill. Um, we think about Ben and money and thrift. And, but I have to say, Ben, right from the start, he, he admired women. He, he wrote this when he was uh, 16. 
uh, in his brother's, um, he was an apprentice for his brother in Boston for the New England Courant. And without telling his brother, uh, he, he ended up publishing um, these, these stories that were anonymous and they were done through the, through the, he loved to imitate women's voices in print. So this one was Silence Do Good. She was a widow and she was giving advice. And of course she was also slamming on some of the uh, puritanical aspects of, um, <laughs> of uh, Boston. And so, but one of them was really interesting because it defended prostitutes in Boston. Again, he was 16. And Boston had, um, you know, a red light district, believe it or not, down by the seaport. And he talked about how the prostitutes were wonderful for business and they were particularly good for the shoemakers because after all, they had to spend a lot of time on the streets. So, you know, what happens with him later, maybe this is just sort of a, the beginning of an, of an idea of his, his whimsical and yet perhaps in some ways serious view. He admired women, um, but there were a lot of things about them that, that frightened him personally. This is his, um, his wife, common law, common law wife, Deborah Reed Franklin. Common law because Ben had a way of, well, not being exactly keeping his promises. He had moved finally to, as you, you may know, he ran off to Philadelphia. He, he didn't like his brother uh, and, uh, treatment of him as an apprentice. Uh, and so he finally ran away to, um, finally ran away to Philadelphia and, uh, and again began to work with another printer. And he eventually roomed with John Reed and John Reed had a daughter named Deborah. And uh, he, as he put it, he, um, he, made some, he made some courtship to her. He had a, a feeling that she had great respect for him. He had great admiration for her. That was all well and good. He hoped to marry her. Of course, Ben, um, was pragmatic from the beginning. And he, he noted that since John Reed was a fairly prosperous carpenter, uh, that there would be a dowry. So, you know, Ben always had a practical eye. Um, and he, um, he did propose to her, but meanwhile, uh, the governor of uh, the colony of Pennsylvania uh, had promised him that he would pay for his transportation, uh, for him to go to England and to purchase uh, printing equipment so Ben could start his own printing company. Well, Ben was thrilled. He believed the governor. And uh, just before he left on that trip, he promised Deborah that he would marry her. Um, and his, by then her father, John Reed had died and her mother, Deborah's mother ran a very rather prosperous ointment and salve sort of business, medicinal, you know, salves and herbs. And she disapproved that they marry. So he promised to marry her and off he went to England. Now, Deborah is only 16 uh, at the time, 16 or 17, we're not exactly sure of when she was born. Um, Deborah waited for him. He went to England and he went with his best friend, James Ralph. And when he got there, he was just dazzled by the, by the culture in London and loved it. And, and uh, took advantage of much of it, the, the theater and the and all, all of the things that, that were offered. And he wrote to Deborah and he said that he wasn't gonna come back anytime in the near future. And Deborah was horrified and, uh, and shocked. And so eventually uh, through the persuasion of her mother and other people, she allowed other men to court her and finally did marry uh, a, a man named John Potter. Now he was English. She was married to him in August um, of, uh, of 1724. And within a month, I think it was, she discovered he, he was English, that he had a wife and a child in England. And that was it for Deborah. Uh, she, 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 she would no longer keep his name. She ended the marriage and she returned to live with her mother. Uh, and so it was a very sort of a sad thing for her. Um, Deborah was a smart woman, despite what the historians have said. And I will show you just in a moment um, that she was painted as an ignorant provincial woman who was you know, nowhere near suitable for a mate. Now she wasn't intellectual in any way, anything like her husband, but that wasn't uh, unusual in those days. Women were not educated beyond learning how to read and write. 
uh, in a rudimentary way so they could be good wives and mothers and housekeepers. Uh, so, you know, this is an example of her writing. Um, and uh, she, she did do the books uh, for uh, her mother and she did uh, become a, an important bookkeeper and financial, uh, in many ways, manager for her husband. I just want to show you some of these. Uh, these are just a few of the four, from the 44 letters we have of her. Uh, that you see that they are, um, they're just, uh, I want to go back on that slide, I'm sorry. Uh, that they're just, um, you know, they look pretty hard to read at that first sentence and begin again to keep an account of expenses. Um, yeah, or the other one below it. I, I want to pick up at the second sentence there. Amos Struttle has bought them at more, and she's talking about houses at more than, than they are worth. Indeed, I wouldn't give half above half for what he, I wouldn't give above half uh, he has for them. Um, but um, the, the correspondence we do have for her, and I'll get back to that, a lot of it has not been saved. A lot of that correspondence, you know, became the basis for historians formally to uh, deride her, to say she was stupid, to say she was ignorant, uh, that she was nowhere near uh, deserving, shall we say, of being Ben's wife. But she was um, the person who, as Ben continued on with his print shop, and she, she ran his stationery store. She turned it into a general store. She made it prosperous. She also helped him run when he became the postmaster, not just of Philadelphia, but eventually of the entire American colonies. She, she, ran, she ran most of it. In fact, Ben once said, when he was departing on a trip um, to England, uh, when he was supposed to turn over this, these duties of the, of the post offices in the colony that he, he wanted him to rely on Mrs. Franklin. He said, she has a great deal of experience in the management of the post office. I depend on your paying considerable attention to her advice. And you know where he mentions Deborah in his autobiography is brief. I have to say that, which is curious, but he does praise her uh, in, a, in, in small, small ways he said, she proved a good and faithful helpmate. She assisted me much by attending the shop. We throve together and have mutually endeavored to make each other happy. Well, sort of. Um, uh, and he, you know, he uses a printer term because what happens later is when he comes back to, I'll come back to that word errata, which is a mistake in printer term. When he came back finally from England, of course, Deborah had, of course, we all can't say divorce. Divorce wasn't really viable for Deborah. Her husband, her, her husband fled to the, to the West Indies. He was, uh, he ran her into debt. He spent her, her dowry. She was neither married nor single. She was in terrible shape. She was, depressed. She was usually high spirited. She was depressed. She was uh, solitary. She didn't socialize. She was, she was depressed and he felt very guilty. And he eventually wanted to, uh, came back, you know, this is some years later now, we're talking the summer of 1730. He came back and he did finally um, admit his guilt to her mother and her mother sort of generously said, well, she hadn't approved the marriage in the first place many years before. So they married, sort of. The common law marriage, as, as Ben said, he took her to, I took her to wife. That was in September 1st, 1730. Now, Deborah, what was she like? We do know from various letters, not just her own correspondence, but from other people's comments, she was, as I say, in, uh, very industrious. Um, she was a, a, a good businesswoman, highly um, skilled at dealing with people, um, very good with numbers and bookkeeping and accounts and, and uh, many and working as a hostess for all the family that continually came through the Franklin home, uh, worked as a, volunteered as a nursemaid uh, for people in the neighborhood who were ill. Um, she, she was a sort of a bundle of energy. Um, and, uh, you know, Franklin was very pleased with her for the first, let's say, 15 years of their marriage. He said, finally, to a, a French associate, I'm lucky enough to find in a wife a frugal woman who thereby became a fortune to me. So, you know, you see that he, he really did value those things about her um, and, uh, and was very pleased. He even he became a mason and he even wrote a poem about her. She was not beautiful, but probably attractive. 
I mean, this this paint, painting of her that was done in 1756 is long after she's in you know she's middle aged by that time, um, but you know he he praised her in a in a poem that's since been preserved so it must have been important it was presented to the Masons in which he celebrates her is his his uh, plain uh, country Jane Joan um, who he, he he adored and he said you know. He praised all the, the good things. She wasn't beautiful, but she did everything to make his home and his children and his marriage and certainly his finances prosperous. So um, this is Deborah up until, and we don't have any real voices at that point about her other than these comments in, in Franklin's bi autobiography. Although she did have, despite her good nature, high spirit, she did have quite a temper. And there are reports of her um, letting, letting people know when they displeased her. Um, Franklin even wrote, he wrote this, he wrote this um, soon, two things. He wrote soon after they were married um, that uh, something in the Pennsylvania Gazette, his newspaper, that, um, you know, uh, rules for promoting marital happiness. Well, this was soon after they were married. I, I don't think that lasted very long because the message was, you know, that the woman should obey her husband. I don't think that lasted too long. A few years later, he wrote another essay in the Pennsylvania Gazette, um, sort of defending what he called a scolding wife. Oh, a scolding wife was wonderful. She had a lot of spirit. Um, she told you where things were at. She was vibrant and healthy, and she would bring forth vibrant children. Well, she did. Um, she did all of those things, but we'll, we'll get back to that in a moment. Um, just trying to get back to my PowerPoint here. And I don't know why it's not advancing, but I'm hoping it will. Let's see if I can, okay. Soon after they were married, Ben came home six months later with a child, an infant son. Uh, Deborah was flabbergasted. And it turned out, of course, it was an illegitimate child from one of his dalliances. Uh, he did admit he had uh, been quite involved with uh, what he called loose women for many years before he married Deborah. And Deborah did not want to raise this baby. She was um, no more than about uh, 19 or 20. It wasn't her child. It's a lot of work raising a child, especially in colonial era, but she did uh, grudgingly raise him. And this child becomes William Franklin, uh, who was, became later the a barrister and a governor of New Jersey. Um, unfortunately, he was on the loyalist side and there were bitter arguments that ensued later uh, about that. But nevertheless, Deborah did raise him. And two years later, she finally did have her own child, a little boy they called Frankie. The, the sorrow involved in that was that Frankie, by the time he was just about four, was suffering from dysentery. It's a terrible disease uh, involving diarrhea and bloody stools, high fevers. And smallpox was raging in, in uh, Philadelphia. And Ben had been lecturing in his Pennsylvania Gazette that people needed to be vaccinated. And, uh, and he and Deborah had been we presume, or maybe they'd had smallpox and survived. But in any case, he couldn't vaccinate little Frankie. He was afraid because Frankie was so sick um, with dysentery and Frankie died. So William becomes his only son. And he and Deborah continue to um, build Frank's, Franklin's fortune. He um, becomes eventually the, um, uh, secretary to the clerk to the assembly. Um, he obtains many government contracts for his printing. He um, uh, begins to um, find and create paper mills. Um, he hires apprentices of his own. Many of them were skilled journeymen. Uh, and he becomes very, very successful and very wealthy uh, for many reasons. Um, and uh, the Franklins do move from one rental house to another. Uh, he's involved in civil and civic uh, betterment. Uh, he creates the Junto, which was a group of young men who were promising 
literary, not all literary, but in various in various occupations. They were first started as tradesmen, but there were many others. They become sort of the, the leading um, people uh, running uh, much of Philadelphia. Uh, he starts a library, a free library, lending library. He creates a fire uh, um, uh, company and, and uh, ha calls for the roads to be paved. <clears throat> many, many civic um, a lending library and, and then finally the American Philosophical Society, a, a learned society which is still in existence today. Uh, so he's very busy with all of that. And um, we, we kind of admire him for all of that. But meanwhile, and he continues to write in the female voice um, for many characters uh, that he sees. It's just his way of kind of making fun of society and people and commenting on them. And then Here's a letter, just a section of a letter that um, he printed in 1745 called Old Mistress's Apologue or Advice to a Friend on Choosing a Mistress. Now, it gets pretty racy. I mean, the, the core message is that you should have an old woman uh, rather than a young one if you're gonna have a mistress. But he doesn't mean old, old. He, what old meant then was really middle-aged today. And there's much more to that. <laughs> Scholars were so, it gets, it gets pretty graphic, this letter. <laughs> um, it, you'll enjoy reading it. Um, but scholars were so horrified and embarrassed that the founding father had written this. And really, I don't know whether he wrote it out of jest because body writing was something that was read in secret by literary men of the era or whether he, there was a truth to it, any kind of a truth to it. Um, it was just done as an experiment or what? We don't know. In any case, the scholars were so horrified, they kept it hidden for almost two centuries until the 1920s when it finally was revealed uh, and is, you know, there today for all to read. Um, around 1753-54, now Franklin, as postmaster of the colonies, has made many remarkable uh, differences in the post. I started a dead letter office, for instance. He has express writers so that there was, you know, quick delivery, many, many other innovations. And he's on a tour to New England, first New York, then New England, to um, improve some of the post offices. And while he's in Boston, uh, through a relative, uh, he meets this 23-year-old woman named Catherine Race. Now, he's 48, almost 49, and she is 23. We don't have her picture, I'm sorry but um, it becomes a love affair. And uh, when she has to leave Boston, she's originally from Block Island, she has to go back to Rhode Island and eventually to Block Island, he offers to escort her back in the carriage. Now, according to Rhode Island historians, it's at least a two day carriage ride. And so there are, they're just totally enchanted with each other. And there are many letters, many by the way, have been destroyed because uh, we only get part of them. And some, some have, uh, Paul, Catherine has even admitted, he calls her Katie, has even admitted she has destroyed some. And we know Ben has destroyed some, but here's a little example. As he wrote to her once when he didn't hear from her, you promised to send me kisses in the wind. Your favorites, this is the winter time, there's snowstorms, they were, they were, I had to go through that in, in the, this, this ride to Rhode Island. Your favors come with the snowy fleeces, which are as pure as your innocent, your virgin in, innocence, white as your lovely bosom and as cold. Well, he wanted to, quote, teach her multiplication. He, he'd written in one of his letters, but she didn't want to learn. So we know they stayed over in an inn at least one night. Where they, how they did, where they did, we, that, that information is gone. But this love affair continued on for a number of months, mostly through letters. Uh, and eventually, I, you know, eventually, you know, Ben even told, um, <laughs> he even told Deborah that he'd met this charming young woman named Catherine Ray. Um, but Deborah seems oblivious to it or, or just knew it was, uh, quotes, harmless flir flirtation. Catherine sends cheese and other things from, from an island is, from Block Island as gifts to the, to the Franklins. And so eventually they, Ben and Katie become friends and they continue a lifelong correspondence. He sees her once or twice later in, in time. Um, but this is just another example of, perhaps if he'd been able to teach her multiplication, it might've been different, but anyway, it wasn't. So 
Now, Ben has been very involved politically. Not only was he initially clerk of the assembly, but he eventually rises to many more powerful positions within it. Uh, and the French and Indian, well, this is, there's many wars, but there are, there are many, many wars that are going on with Europe and the French come over because the French are involved uh, in trying to um, occupy uh, most of the middle section uh, what we would, what, uh, of uh, the colonies and sort of hedge the uh, British over only to the coast. Uh, this is not gonna sit well with Pennsylvania, especially because uh, on the Western frontier near the Ohio River, there's, uh, and, and Virginia is involved and New York is involved and Massachusetts to some degree are involved in these incursions and hostilities by the French who align with some of the Native Americans, not all, some of the Native Americans side with the British side. But anyway, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a, a bitter kind of a war. A lot of people are killed, settlers are, are, are killed and uh, it's, it's not a good situation and Ben, is um, the, con the assembly decides that since he is so politically skilled and he no longer, of course, uh, has to be involved in business, he's now so wealthy, he basically is retired, that he should be the one to go uh, to England and fight against the Pens. And the Pens owned, in, in a sense, they were proprietors of Pennsylvania colony, uh, unlike other uh, colonies which meant they, they had ultimate say, and they were supposed to pay taxes to defend the frontier, but they did not. So there's great havoc and many, um, many papers are written by Ben, um, and many, many things happen where there's a militia that he organizes and so on. But anyway, it doesn't work out. He needs money from the pens and he needs support, and he wants to get rid of the proprietorship and have it become just a royal charter from the crown, the British crown. So assembly appoints him to go to England, plead with the pens and then take the case, his grievance perhaps to, um, to the crown, to, to the throne, to parliament and to the throne. So he does, he, he goes to England in 1757 and he lodges at the home of a widow, a middle-class widow named Margaret Stevenson. And her townhouse is at what we now, what is now called 36 Craven Street in London. It's near Charing Cross. I've been there myself. Uh, to, when I was there though, <clears throat> it wasn't yet where it is now, which is um, a museum. It's the Benjamin Franklin house. We don't know a lot about Margaret. We know she was more or less the same age. We think she was born in 1705. Uh, lovely woman, much like Deborah, um, warm, supportive, um, totally entranced by Ben. She took care of his wardrobe. She nursed him when he got sick and he got sick pretty early on from that foggy cold dust air in London. She um, indoctrinated him into the ways of English customs. She introduced him to her friends and uh, they, they socialized together and they went to events together and their friends assumed that they were an item. Um, Deborah, had, I should say, Deborah did not want to go to England, no matter what Ben expected her to go with him. 70, no, she wouldn't go. Uh, nobody knows why. To me, it was the worst mistake in Deborah's life. Um, the theory, one of the theories is uh, that she, um, she had come over as a child uh, and uh, from Birmingham, well, not from Birmingham, but anyway, where they sailed from was, it was such a terrible journey with her parents when she was very young that she just didn't want to set beyond the sea again. So we don't know why, but Ben, ben was quite unhappy about it, but they wrote affectionate letters to each other continually. Um, and he sent her many presents and she sent him all kinds of um, things from America, apples and buckwheat and, and some various kinds of crops and harvest goods from Pennsylvania um, to remind him of home. And yet we know that he had this very warm relationship uh, with Mrs. Stevenson. Uh, and there's an odd series of, um, of letters that go back and forth where he addresses her, Deborah, as my dear child. 
and she addresses him the same. I think that's like the equivalent of dear sweetie today or baby or something. Um, and they send each other lovely, lovely letters. And yet he acknowledges finally he is very fond of Mrs. Stevenson and living with her. Um, he later says to her daughter, which I'll get to in a moment, that living with her was uh, among the, the happiest days of his life. He's only supposed to be in England for maybe a year, six months to a year, and it turns out to be five years. And I have to tell you this one quick story that his friend, uh, the publisher William Strahan writes to Deborah and says that she should hurry up and come over because to protect her interests, that there were many women that would travel and sail twice as far across the Atlantic to be with Ben. And of course she is referring also to Mrs. Mrs. Stevenson, but that makes no difference. Ultimately for Deborah, she never does go to England. Deborah, um, uh, well, Deborah of course has already had a daughter named Sally and Mrs. Stevenson has a daughter named Polly. Well, it's Mary, but Polly is what she was known as. And although Ben is continually lecturing his own daughter, Sally, to be thrifty and to be moral and to read religious tracts and so on. He indulges Polly in many different ways. And Polly is very bright and she's inquisitive and she's asking him questions all the time and he's explaining natural phenomena to her. And she becomes his favorite, his English daughter, as he puts it. In fact, he soon considers the Stevensons his English family. Polly uh, gets married soon after uh, after Sally does. And Sally, it's, it's Deborah's one sort of act of rebellion. Deborah allows Sally to marry Richard Beige. And Richard Beige was a in, sort of an impoverished merchant and Franklin did not approve. But anyway, they did it. What ensues is kind of a rivalry because as they have children, both Mary is having children, that is Polly, and Deborah is having children. It's kind of a competition about their grandchildren that is both amusing and poignant. Now, what about Ben? You know, how, how lusty is he really? Is this exaggerated stuff? Is this myth, mythic stuff? Is, I mean, there are some silly comments on the internet about how many illegitimate children he had. But anyway, Charles Wilson Peale was a young artist, and American, and he went to, to London to study art. And he lived for a while, as Mrs. Stevenson did take in boarders, he lived for a while in the Craven Street townhouse. And one day, inadvertently, 1768, I believe it was, yes, uh, they think it's around then, he, he happened to, he knew Ben and he was friendly with Ben and he admired him. And he happened to open the door to Ben's room and he found Ben there with a woman um, and in a, in, a, in a intimate pose. And he quickly, here's another one, certainly even more intimate. He quickly shut the door and ran back and made sketches of it. And we don't know more about it. We don't know who the woman was. We don't know what that was about. I, it obviously was not Polly and it was not Mrs. Stevenson because he would have identified that in some way. So the mystery remains. Now, Deborah, unfortunately, suffers strokes and by 1774, actually before that, she, she is, she is uh, lingering, but she is doing very poorly. She's becoming more and more weak and she can't take care of many of the financial duties that she had shouldered while Ben was away. And finally, she keeps longing for Ben to come back. And, and this, by the way, I'm sorry, I should have backed up. This is a second trip um, that Ben uh, had made uh, to England, which began uh, in, in uh, 1763, because things still hadn't gone well and the revolution was beginning to boil up. So once again, he's back. He soon becomes the actual sort of minister representative of the colonies as, as things get really rough uh, in, in the colonies and pre-revolutionary fervor. But back to 1774, Deborah, um, Deborah is still waiting. Now she's been waiting 10 years because it's, it's almost 10 years since Ben has gone. This is the second trip. And she keeps pleading with him to come back. And he's just much too involved in the politics of what's going on. He cannot come back. This is, this, now we're talking about the early 19, sorry, the early 1770s. 
So um, Deborah finally dies on December of 1774. And he is left a widow. He comes back some months later after the British uh, shame him and blame him for uh, inciting more American uh, rebellion. And it all has to do with Hutchison. It's a whole other story. Some of you may know about the Watley affair, uh, which involved a letter that letters that implicated Hutchison as one of the uh, one of the people who had really made the situation in Boston and Massachusetts much worse, uh, creating therefore uh, a backlash by the American patriots. Anyway, he comes back in 1775, soon after, uh, I wanna come back to that, soon after the, um, soon after uh, the bloodshed breaks out in Lexington and Concord. And, but within another year, even though he now has served in the, the uh, various Congresses and also gone up to, to towards Canada and, and, and seen Washington and Boston and his troops, um, he comes back to, I don't know what happened here. I want to come back here. This is giving me trouble. Um, let me come back. He um, finally is sent by the American, the American government, uh, the, the new government to France. And he is to be one of the three commissioners who will negotiate with France for uh, some financial help because the as you know, very impoverished um, situation in Congress and the need uh, to have help because they can't support these troops, they can't buy weapons, uh, they can't uh, plan anything without money that will be behind it to back it. So he is one of the three commissioners who goes, eventually he becomes um, the head minister, the minister of plenip plenipotentiary. But in any case, he lives in um, Paris for a while and then he can't stand again the coal, coal infested air and he longs to be in the country and a nobleman invites him to come to nearby Passy. And Passy is now part of, uh, I think it's the 16th arrondissement in Paris. But while he is there and he's living in an estate that is owned by this nobleman and Dean, uh, one of his fellow commissioners also joins him and he's able to go by carriage. It takes about a half an hour to get back into central London where he negotiates with Virgin and, uh, and the other uh, people involved in the court and the treasury and so on. While he's in Passé living in this estate, he is introduced to this beautiful woman. She's considered the most beautiful woman in America, in uh, France, uh, Anne-Louise Bovin de hardencourt Briand. And this is, we think this is her picture. Again, I, this one, we don't really know. We think it is, uh, so we're not sure, but she was um, a very talented musician uh, she was um, an advocate of the new piano forte, uh, which, is, which is very new. Uh, Boccherini was so impressed with her that he devoted uh, uh, his six sonata to her. He falls madly in love with her. And she, she's um, in 33, uh, and she is married to, uh, through a arranged marriage to a very wealthy man. She's the mother of two children, but she is totally enthralled with Ben. And what ensues is a love affair. And she, she uh, sits on his lap in public. She, there's uh, this well over a hundred letters she writes to him um, in which she protests her everlasting love. Um, and she, um, she, uh, she just depends on him. And the letters are very charming and quite, um, quite elegant and independent. She's a well-educated woman. She's highly intelligent. And she's really sort of a professional flirt. Um, and she almost drives him mad. The letters go on and on. They meet every week. They have dates at her estate on Wednesdays and Saturdays. They play chess with each other. Uh, her husband knows about it. He even knows that Ben has been kissing his wife um, because he has a mistress anyway, but that's beside the point. She calls him mon cher papa um, and she professes eternal love. The letters are quite something to read. And yet she will, not, she will not give him the last favor. And finally, you know, this goes on for way over a year. He sort of throws up his hands. You know, she makes comments like, I desire you love me forever. Um, and you must love me and not any other woman. <laughs> Very possessive. And he becomes angry and he compares his love to 
Cupid. He says, my poor little boy, who you should have cherished, instead of being fat and jolly, it's meager and starved almost to death, uh, while his mother inhumanely denies him. And now you want to clip his wings and prevent him from seeking love elsewhere. And uh, well, this goes on and on. But eventually, he becomes tired of it. And he finds another lady. And this particular woman is um, Anne Catherine de Ligneville. De, I don't pronounce this too well, Entrecourt. She is the widow to a philosopher named uh, Helvetius, Claude Adrian Helvetius. And she's quite unconventional. She had lived a conventional life for quite a long time. She now ran, a hosted a very famous salon that had the greats, the, all the, the most important philosophers uh, of the Enlightenment. Uh, in her salon. These are two pictures. Uh, I, she was in her 50s uh, by the time he met her. He, he adores her. She has a, has a menagerie <clears throat> in her home and out in the, this garden. She has <clears throat> all kinds of people who are running back and forth all the time. She's on a frantic social schedule. She doesn't keep a real good social calendar. So she has three, three single men who live with her, uh, two Abbeys and a medical student. And she uh, assigns them to dispatch most of her letters, continues to flirt with him. And um, he, <clears throat> he uh, becomes passionate, passionately involved with her, totally intrigued. She's so unconventional and so bold. And, you know, she's, that when Abigail and John Adams come, she's just, they're just horrified at, at who she is and her manner and her familiarities with Ben. But ultimately, he becomes, he proposes to her continually. Now he's in his 70s. Did he propose to her because it was sexual passion? Did he propose to her because now he's worried that he's, he's getting older and where is he going to live? You know, he writes her things like, I've given you any number of my days and the least you can do is give me some of your nights. And she doesn't or won't ultimately. And he becomes more and more embroiled in her. Uh, to the point where she becomes, and she's a very cool, experienced woman, she becomes so frightened that she finally flees, flees to Tours until he can calm himself down. And eventually later, they do become friends. But to me, all of these things that I've mentioned about the women that he's, that he's met and that he's lived with, or at least flirted with some of them, Ben, he, iconically, he's a man of discretion. He does everything with reason. You will see and probably know uh, from your own research and many of his, his political outbursts, he does have political outbursts. But I, I, to me, this is his personal life is very much like that. It's a combination. To me, he's a man who struggles between passion and prudence. Uh, and I think viewing that through the lens of his women, it, it becomes you know, even more clear than, than really has, has been revealed earlier. So um, here we are, and I love this statement of his, you know, he said, if passion drives, let reason hold the reins, but that doesn't always happen. So that's, that's the book. That's my message um, about this. Um, it's coming out in March. It was supposed to have come out right now, but we have all our shipment issues. So here it is. And um, if you know, you wish to get a copy, uh, you can just go to Google, and there are many different ways to, to get it uh, online. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing now, and um, I hope that if you have questions, um, we can try to answer them. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and I would just uh, like to uh, reiterate to all of the guests attending that we use the Q&A function uh, for questions. So if you have any questions, uh, please type it into the Q&A. And we have um, a couple uh, to get started with. Um, so Emily said, uh, do you think the death of Frankie caused a rift in, the, in Franklin's marriage? Uh, uh, that's a good question, a wonderful question. And in fact, there was a scholar who wrote in the Smithsonian Magazine some time ago, an article just actually saying, well, it was actually quite misogynist. He blamed, um, he blamed um, Deborah. He said she clung to Frankie. And she was so protective of him that she wouldn't allow uh, him to be inoculated. And she, the reason she clung to him is they didn't have a good marriage and that this was a way to keep Ben involved in the marriage. I mean, it's that article, well, I comment on it in the book, but um, no, I don't think so. 
okay, why didn't Deb, why didn't Deborah have children for the next seven years? Well, we don't know, but my suspicion is she must have had a number of miscarriages because she did not have another child uh, until she had Sally in 1743. But I think they had a very happy marriage because if you if you read through the letters, even and again, we don't hear Deborah's voice until the second his second trip because he threw out most of her letters in the first trip. We have his letters, but there's great affection. And maybe they just came to an understanding. Um, marriage in the 18th century wasn't like marriage today. It was pragmatic. So he's very pragmatic. If she didn't want to go to England, he had to go and that was it. And he had to be free to do what he needed to do. But I think there was deep affection between them. That kind of goes to another question we had, which was, um, can you help us understand how common it was in the late 18th century for men to have multiple families or conflicting, conflicting romantic entanglements? Uh, was this common or was Franklin sort of an anomaly? And I think Franklin, of course, had some degree of celebrity, so he may have been acting differently than your average sailor. <laughs> Um, well, let me let me start off by saying that um, they there have been estimates that 50% of all marriages were the woman was already pregnant. So we know there was plenty of dalliance that went on in the 18th century, just like there is today. Of course, today, <laughs> it's a whole different different thing. Uh, the, the norm quote was marriage, but there's certainly enough literature and letters and historical data to suggest that people are no different today than they were then. Uh, ben, However, Ben is actually one reviewer said he had a number of let's call them bizarre relationships. Some of them were pretty interesting. But you know, Ben, I won't say bizarre. Ben was a genius. Ben had an unusual personality, and I think he attracted uh, a lot of unusual women. He was extremely charming. I mean, there's some things about Ben I just love. I mean, these are funny comments. I mean, when he was with Margaret Stevenson, and she was. I guess she was sulking one time when they had an argument and he wrote, he wrote, wrote this comment, uh, uh, Margaret wrote it actually. She said, but he said, you're in a pie crust, you know, instead of saying you're sulking. I mean, he just, he was that kind of person. And, you know, we all know, um, we all know many people who, what is it? Some of the, some of the statistics on, you know, um, extramarital affairs um, indicate that they're, pretty common today and, and were then too, I'm sure. Um, Cynthia asked, uh, do you think he would have actually married any of the women to whom he proposed or would he have just kept them um, hanging as he did with Deborah? Just sort of an interesting. Ben had a problem. He said, he even admitted to Polly, his English daughter, that he, he his life, he had kept his women 10 leagues apart. Now he doesn't mean that geographically, he means emotionally. Uh, but I think that there are many high achieving men, for better or for worse, maybe, maybe today it's a little different, but there are many high achieving men. Let me just look at the headlines. Just look at, look at some of what we see right, right now. Um, uh, you know, we don't have to go through who they are, but um, that uh, the marriage is only um, of convenience or of habit or that they, mo they move on. And, uh, you know, many of the theories about Ben was he moved on from her, that he grew away from her. I don't think so. I don't think that was it. I think politics and doing well for others and, and making a difference in the world is what propelled him more than anything else. So uh, Darcy asked, um, what do you think accounts for Deborah's dismissal by historians as stupid. Uh, clearly that assessment was untrue. She managed uh, businesses successfully and even in the letter you showed, uh, the evidence is there that she was, in, was intelligent. Basically she couldn't spell and made poor romantic choices. Plenty of brilliant women do that still today. Uh, why was she dismissed so quickly? Well, you can see from that little section that I, I put in of, of her writing. I mean, that's what they saw. And they didn't even see that until again, the last 10 years of her life. So, and he only gives her in his, his autobiography, a few things I read you, that's it. I mean, it's a pretty long autobiography. You know, it's all about him. Um, so, you know, yeah, she, she, you know, she cooked, she washed, she'd entertained, she had his children, she ran his, but you know, that, that was this not acknowledgement, nor by the way, was that, was that the norm in those days? I mean, women were taught to be subservient. The French women, by the way, weren't so subservient, but um, women were taught 
in America anyway, to be subservient. And uh, there are many cases where Deborah, despite her sometimes fiery temper, she would be subservient to, to men. So, um, you know, I just think that's she, between that and, and her terrible spelling, which all women had, if they wrote at all at that time, because they weren't taught spelling uh, and the way she's, she's marginalized in his life um, accounts for her, her really dire historical picture. If, if our legacies were based on our spelling, I would be in some trouble. <laughs> we have spell check. They didn't have a spell check. <laughs> That's true. Spell check changed my life. Uh, so Joseph asks, uh, is it possible that Ben took Deborah as his wife because he needed a mother for his son, William? Thank you for asking that question. It's a great one. And that question has been asked repeatedly by historians. And we knew there was kind of a deadline. We don't even know exactly how old William is. <laughs> There's been books written on how old William is or isn't, was, was or wasn't. But he was obviously very young. And for whatever reason, this woman who birthed him could not take care of him. So he had to, yes, he had to find a wife. And the circumstances lined up well. He had been engaged to Deborah. Uh, he was back. He did, as he writes in his autobiography, felt guilty about her. Um, she was available. Um, and he was doing pretty well as a young printer, not fabulously yet. So there were a lot of reasons. I don't think it was the prime, although it certainly was a compelling factor um, that he needed somebody. By the way, there is one historian who commented that um, he didn't think that, that William was the product of one of the quotes, low women that Ben cohabited with. He thought since, since Ben claimed him as his son, that he had to, this woman had to be, you know, high, of higher, you know, ethics that she, well, in a sense, higher class anyway, that she wasn't a prostitute, that she was some, probably the friend, somebody's, somebody's wife whose husband was at sea for a long time or something. And so we had this affair with her and she couldn't keep the child, obviously, afterwards. Who knows? Um, so uh, we have a couple more questions and um, just being conscious of time, we can probably just get to a couple more, but sure. uh, McKenna asks, um, how was this research different from your other publications? Since some of the letters have been destroyed, how did your work uh, uh, pass the lack of, or work past the lack of letters or loss of time between letters? Well, it's a good question, um, McKenna. Um, McKenna from Bowling Green University. We've had a little correspondence. Um, yes. Uh, well, first of all, there were a number of comments about Deborah that are made before we can hear her voice in her later letters. A number of people have commented, a number of things. There's, there's uh, some of her writing in some of the ledger books. Um, so there was a lot that one could... Uh, and, and some, some really nasty stuff from Ben's enemies as well. So there were a lot of things one could understand about Deborah. Um, so that, that was very helpful. So there, one, could, one had a picture of her, one could get a picture of her, but not until, of course, when you got the letters, then you really got the whole picture um, as she was a, a caring, a generous person. Um, different from other, other historical books I've written, um, Hard to say. I mean, I, the, the ones that I have been fortunate enough to write about other historical women, there has been correspondence. So I'm so glad that there was some for this book, although it was more difficult. And I should mention, I started this book 20, 26 years ago and put it aside um, because nobody wanted to write a book, of, wanted a book on Deborah Franklin alone. They didn't want a book on Deborah Franklin and they didn't care about anybody else. So put it aside several times, um, took it out of the back file twice. Um, and now that we have digitization, which we did for the, the Yale papers, uh, the Franklin papers at, at the Library of Congress, I was able to access this in a somewhat easier way. Uh, well, this sort of ties to another question. Uh, Susan asked, what inspired you to decide to write this book? Which in this case, maybe what inspired you to finish the book? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we well, always start with a question, um, you know, and I read, read a lot and research a lot and you have questions about people. And it was like, well, my question, let's go back 26 years was, this was supposed to have been, what kind of a marriage was this? And if they were so affectionate to each other, why weren't they together? 
And were they really affectionate? I mean, so those were the questions that prodded me to find answers. And then pretty soon, you know, you're knee deep in research. <laughs> there you are. All right, yeah, so it's, it's wonderful. Um, you know, <clears throat> it, you become sort of a detective and, and that's one of the fun parts of the discoveries that you make. And things are so different in what's in the records, in, in the correspondence or in the, then in the iconic view with a, the kind of view that we read in history books. I mean, when I remembered Benjamin Franklin's kid growing up, I mean, this, this perfect human being who was so wise and so contained and he just was, you know, and we all, and that's so different from what, as you look deeper as to what it is. And then it's so dimensionalized when you, when you get there and, and, uh, you know, slowly, slowly, as historians have begun to look at the many different sides of an issue, uh, some of this is coming to light in, in a better way. So um, we have one last question, which I think we can get to. Uh, Angela said, uh, ultimately, did Ben communicate any guilt for abandoning, abandoning uh, Deborah? Um, sorry, the question just disappeared. Uh, for abandoning Deborah during the Stamp Act crisis or Sally during the occupation? Well, um, Deborah, by the way, defended their home with gunpoint during the Stamp Act. Sure, he was guilty. And maybe that's why these letters are so affectionate and he showers her with gifts. I mean, there are thousands of gifts that are sent over the period of those 15 years that they were apart. China and clothes and cloth and gadgets and and it goes on and on, crystal and all kinds of things. I mean, Deborah does her part too, but this, he's clearly guilty. And he always is signing it, my, your affectionate husband and my dear child. And uh, sometimes he praises her most, you know, he will praise her occasionally. Um, so sure there was guilt, but you know, this was a man whose, whose soul was divided between what he needed and wanted to do for the colonies uh, and, his personal life and was distant, uh, you know, she becomes what I call in the book, a ghost wife for many years. So nevertheless, there's still memory and there's still allegiance and there's still guilt. Well, thank you very much. Um, and I think that we need to be conscious of people's time. So um, bookshop.org supports uh, locally owned bookstores. So uh, I would encourage you to, to use bookshop.org. Um, of course, there's also through the publisher uh, and through uh, that other online retailer whose name will not be mentioned. There's um, other, on other ones too. <laughs> Um, but of course, you can also wait until March uh, and then uh, support your own uh, local independent bookstore. Um, and I'd just like to thank you very much, Nancy, for a great uh, presentation. And I, I thank everyone for joining us. Thank you so much. It was really fun. <laughs>